Hey, I'm Derek, it's me, Derek, and welcome to Stop Skeletons and Fighting. A lot of things shook the world of entertainment in the late 2000s and early 010s. The Wii, Netflix streaming, HD video, the Apple App Store, but an often overshadowed but still hugely impactful trend in this era was the rise of retro video games. 3D graphics and improved HD fidelity gave way to pixel-coded nostalgia and an unending sea of represent and blow me t-shirts. Of course, you think of the Wii Virtual Console, and while that was the gender reveal party that truly sparked the retro wildfire that still burns today, the Xbox 360 launched a year earlier and was loaded with retro games available to download on XBLA. Galaga, Smash TV, Ultimate World Combat 3. In fact, there wasn't much else to spend your Microsoft points on. Not that they didn't try to sell you picture packs like this one. I can't imagine why they had to specify no refunds. Hmm. Even if Nintendo gets most of the credit, retro games on XBLA were still putting up impressive numbers for Microsoft, but it wasn't enough. They wanted to take down the virtual console and the thing to do it was Game Room? <laughs> a Microsoft exclusive live service app featuring hundreds of retro titles where you could customize a personal arcade with games at three bucks a pop. That's right, the Kinect was going after the Wii's motion controls. Bye bye Wii. <laughs> and Game Room was going after a virtual console. But Game Room was such a failure, so completely dead on arrival, no one even remembers it, but I remember. I remember Game Room being a buggy mess filled with mostly Atari 2600 and Intellivision games, all topped off with an absolutely horrible business model. Welcome back to Passmortem, where we break down and explore the stories of video games. And yes, after dazzling you with a Game Room tour of my very own just weeks ago, I've decided to completely wreck my SEO and confuse everybody with a tour of Xbox Game Room Misery. Were you searching for a clever way to stack your DVD cases and shelves made for books? Too bad. It's time to hold your arms out to your side and talk about the time that Microsoft forgot they were already selling retro games and tried to build a flashy virtual arcade that no one cared about. But first, Launchpad, what's wrong? Do you smell products and services again? Wow, it's Ritual. Not for puppies, okay? It's actually for humans who don't get to eat a perfectly balanced meal of dusty kibble every day. Ritual Essential for Men contains 10 high quality nutrients like vitamin A, D, omega-3, and zinc that are difficult for human men to get from their diet alone. I like taking multivitamins for peace of mind and I'd like that Ritual transparently shows off their ingredients, which are vegan, non-GMO, gluten-free, allergen-free, and contain no added sugar. Ritual helps people fill the gaps in their diet without shady additives, filler, or colorants. All in two easy-to-take capsules delivered straight to your door every month for just a dollar a day. And then deliver it to my body through my mouth, my human mouth, because I'm not a puppy. Fill in the gaps in your diet with Essential for Men, a small step that helps support a healthy foundation for your body. Ritual are offering 20% off your first month by going to ritual.com slash SSFF20. Use the code SSFF20 at checkout. It's so easy, a dog could do it, but they can't do it, they wouldn't do it because Ritual is for humans only. They even have vitamins specialty for women, 50 plus, prenatal, postnatal, 18 vitamin, and essential protein. That's ritual.com slash SSFF20 and use the code SSFF20 at checkout. Thanks to Ritual for sponsoring this part of the episode. So how did we get here? He's really not going to move, is he? No, I don't just, all right, well, fine. According to this guy, Frank Pape, the idea for Game Room was born in a 2008 meeting with some higher ups, including this guy, Mark Winton, who you might remember from such hits as, we're bringing a new Kinect sensor paired with every Xbox One. But this was way before the Xbox One and the Kinect for 360. This was when the Red Ring of Death was just in the Xbox's rearview mirror. This meeting for Game Room took place at the beginning of the Don Matrick era, around when Xbox was setting their sights on Nintendo by pivoting more towards a more casual market with things like Netflix and the NXE dashboard redesign. That was, by the way, when Xbox added avatars. Hey, check me out, I'm a Wii, hey! According to Pape, this is how the Game Room meeting went down. They said, hey, maybe we ought to go do an emulator, maybe a Dreamcast emulator. And I said, you know what, I love Dreamcast, but maybe we should do an everything emulator. And they were like, can we do that? Yeah, let's go do that, and here you go. We were this close to a Dreamcast emulator. Ill bleed. 
Cannon Spike. Power Stone. Soul Calibur. We got Soul Calibur, that's right. Sonic Shuffle. Justice for Sonic Shuffle. We never, we could have had Sonic Shuffle and Ill Bleed. We're in the wrong timeline. Burn it all down. All right, all right. So when everything emulator sounds pretty cool, but why? You need to remember that this pitch happened in 2008, when retro gaming content as a fresh new thing was at its peak or very near its peak. I kind of always get the sense that the retro arcade games that were on XBLA at launch were a bit of an accident. But within a few years, there wasn't just Wii Virtual Console. Sony had PS1 classics, and tons of retro revivals and throwbacks were popping up everywhere. James Nintendo Nerd himself had only just become the biggest thing on gaming YouTube. This game is poop from a butt. Wait. That's not what I said. This is even when I started building my audience just reviewing obscure retro games. There was a huge burgeoning community of retro gamers ready to be catered to, but Xbox was still the new kid and didn't have any of its own old IP to repackage. Hence why Xbox Live Arcade was already a dumping ground for retro games from third parties where they were selling like hotcakes. But Game Room would be their attempt to expand. So work began. Paper brought in Australian developer Chrome Studios, probably best known for Taz the Tasmanian Tiger and the Legend of Spyro reboot. But I suspect Microsoft hired them for their work on 2008's Seen It Box Office Smash, one of the first Xbox 360 games to incorporate the new avatars and happened to use custom controllers? Babe! No! But Doom! No! But I just... The vision for Game Room was deceptively simple. A dynamic, animated hub for authentically emulated games using original code with the added interactive competitive element Xbox Live was known for. And, at least at first, they were going to target gamers born in the 60s and 70s, a market rapidly aging out of modern gaming, and ones who would have had a strong connection to arcades. Basically, guys about this age. Maybe it's because I'm actually in the tail end of this age group, but this sounds like a really solid pitch to me. At this point, arcades have been basically dead for about a decade, and accurately recreating that experience virtually, I don't know, that could be a money printing machine. However, it was a lot more difficult to convince the people who actually mattered, the license holders. Microsoft pitched around, but for publishers, quote, already making a healthy living off of their IP, there wasn't much to buy into. This right here was a major underlying issue for Game Room. We're not exactly sure why, but they had trouble getting games. Sega, SNK, Namco, Capcom, and many others were actively dumping their classics onto Wii, onto PSN, onto friggin' XBLA, but not onto Game Room. What's the deal? I guess locking games instead of a dinky app exclusively on Microsoft platforms made it a tough sell, even if all they had to do was provide old game code? Or maybe their negotiation tactics were terrible. Either way, something clearly wasn't working here. But eventually, Microsoft was able to land four giants of retro gaming. Activision, Atari, Intellivision, and Konami. Not a bad set of names, and don't worry. Once things got going, they'd come around. It's, fine. it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. What, what, what's, what's wrong? Nothing. Now they just needed to figure out that everything emulator. Luckily, Chrome was well suited for the nuts and bolts side of Game Room. While they sometimes got game ROMs from companies themselves, a majority of the games were pulled from the raw boards. Console games weren't necessarily hard once they got the emulator going, though there are things to say about the Intellivision trackball emulation. The big technical challenge was the arcade games. Nearly every arcade game runs on custom hardware, meaning that most arcade titles needed unique software to run. Not an impossible task, but not exactly an easy one either. After about a year and change of production, Game Room was officially announced in January 2010 at Microsoft's CES keynote. The pitch was that arcades were an incredibly powerful and social form of gaming, the likes of which could only be realized again with the power of Xbox Live, a la Avatar, Robbie Bach, and Steve Ballmer. Man, they were really proud of those avatars. The arcade decorations do look pretty neat, and who wouldn't want to visit your friend's personal arcade just to ruin all their high scores? Oh, in addition, all of these games and their achievements would be accessible with the PC. Play them on both your Xbox 360 and your Windows PC with the same games, the same achievements, and the same leaderboards. Windows and Xbox? Finally the full 
power of Games for Windows Live. Thanks to Game Room. And how many games are going to be there? Over a thousand games over the next three years on Game Room. A thousand? Okay, researching this was so weird for me because I was there for this in 2010, active in the retro gaming scene with a small retro gaming YouTube show on a retro gaming website. But Game Room, all of this somehow was completely off my radar. In fact, if it wasn't for the infectious coverage of Jeff Gerstmann from the then still nascent Giant Bomb, I wouldn't have ever noticed. Look at him chatting with Frank Pape. Look at him smiling. What? What is that? If you are not familiar with Gerstmann, this is what he looks like now. Coincidence? Man, what a game room do to you, Gerstmann. Flash forward to three months later, March 24th, 2010, the launch of Game Room. And at first glance, it was super slick. It gave you three floors, each with four rooms to display up to eight arcade machines. The activity you see and just the sounds you hear. Are really good. I mean, compare that to today, we still get nightmare cacophonies like Pac-Man Museum Plus. But Game Room did decently capture the vibe of a vibrant, noisy, packed arcade. I think the mascots flying around are adorable, and credit where credit is due, this was apparently Frank Pape's idea. However, arcade machines themselves are a mixed bag. Some have art assets on them and look amazing, others are basically as generic as corporately possible. Apparently a lot of this was chrome filling in the blanks when the original companies either didn't have or didn't provide marquee or cabinet art assets. And you'll never guess who the worst culprit was. There was lots of room customization. If you wanted to make a room dedicated to jungler, go nuts. Let your jungler flag fly free. Room aesthetics themselves look really nice, and eventually they upgraded the Konami arcade games with Japanese-style arcade cabs, which is a nice touch. And the cherry on top, you could see your friends' avatars roaming around, playing games, watching over the shoulders of others playing. It's a really great touch that simulates a lively arcade experience with friends. And that is the end of the good bits. I am sorry, I am not trying to be mean but it is impossible to overstate what a massive Derek makes a fart noise this whole thing was. Game Room was not the interactive virtual arcade that it appeared to be in the trailers. You'd see your friends' avatars walking around, but not your friends. This was not Animal Crossing arcades. Did you want to see your friends' cool custom Game Room? Awesome! Go drive to their house like it's Ashley 1984. The reality is this, Game Room was just a very shiny game menu, which was barely even a novelty in 2010. Hell, Namco had an interactive museum in 1995, and many other games have flirted with this idea ever since. In fact, PlayStation Home had a Namco museum where you, as your avatar, could wander around. And it gets even worse. Game Room did not have online multiplayer. Where's the power of Xbox Live now, huh? There had to have been some weird technical hurdle because there was local co-op, Marvel at the engaging co-op of 2600 Combat. Finally in 2010. Okay, no shade to Combat, it is absolutely a classic, but I just cannot understand why this couldn't have been done online. Now there was online functionality. It had this really neat challenge system where you could watch a replay of someone else playing up to a crazy level in something like Yar's Revenge for the 2600 to tighten up your strats or to send game data to your friends as a challenge and force your friends to attempt high-level Yars play from where the replay left off. This, I think, is really, really cool and something I wish I could do on an official emulator like Switch Online. But this was really it, and this is not really what Game Room should have been as a multiplayer and social game. So that was the feature side. What about the games? This, this game is of historical significance. On March 24th, Game Room launched with over 30 titles, including heavy hitters like Crystal Castles, Asteroids Deluxe, Combat, Adventure, and Tempest, but also dipped into the more obscure stuff like Mountain Madness and Jungler. It's not a bad stretch of games. No hate on Combat or Astro Smash, but a lot of these aren't actually arcade games. So are we emulating 80s arcades or living rooms? Because if we're doing living rooms, Where's the shag carpeting? I need my grandma's green shag carpeting. You know what I'm talking about. 
However, while Microsoft would deliver on the promise of weekly game drops, it would be over a month before that started. They launched with 30 games in late March, which wasn't even enough to fill one whole floor of your arcade, by the way. And it was crickets until May 5th when Game Pack 3 released, which was only seven games, but at least one of them was Pitfall. And to make it even weirder, this wasn't even all of Pack 3, but it also had a slew of games that were announced, but not released with the rest of the pack. Okay, you see, even though the games were released in packs, they would still release them weekly. So for example, Game Pack 5 released in June 2nd, June 9th, and June 16th. But then Game Pack 6 released June 23rd, June 30th, and July 7th. I guess as a way to stretch out their content, or because they genuinely needed the extra time to get all the games ready? It's not like they were releasing a ton of content. It wasn't even until July 21st that there were even enough games to fill an entire arcade. And even then, Microsoft never added more rooms or anything. Weekly game drops dwindled to as low as four games a week. And as the months rolled on, it became clear that the majority of Game Room's games were not heavy hitters. Konami wasn't putting out the mega hits like Turtles, instead saving them for Xbox Live Arcade. Instead, you got a taste of the really cool weird stuff like Galactic Warriors and the truly awful stuff like Checkers and Concentration. Bottom of the barrel. Don't worry, the screen going black is normal. It's thinking about its next move. Really? Really. I can't help but think about how cool Game Room could have been, like if it actually had a Dreamcast emulator, or if they had opened it up a bit to put out homebrew indie titles like Halo 2600. Instead, we had literal meme games like Venetian Blinds, a game where you lower and raise blinds. That is it. That is, if, if you take nothing else from this video, know that Xbox Game Room charged money for a tech demo created as a joke. But the games, and the lack of online, and everything else, all paled in comparison to Game Room's biggest problem. It's pricing model. I've tiptoed around it so far, but everything delivered and promised by Game Room was overshadowed by this reality. Game Room was a free download, a DRM-riddled app selling games for 240 to 400 Microsoft points each, or 3 to $5 a pop. That's right, each game costs three dollars five if you wanted to access them also on xbox and pc three dollars three dollars for games your target audience definitely already own physically if not through emulation i don't know doesn't seem that great in 2010 would i pay three dollars for say a pitfall yeah probably but what about three dollars for Laser Blast for the 2600. Hey, you like this screen? Yeah, I hope you like it, because it's all you're gonna get. It's, it's literally just this screen. It, that's the whole game. Okay, and no shade to this era of gaming. This was the start of it all. Everything we play today is standing on the shoulders of this era. And I mean, who isn't down for some classic arcade super breakout? But who's paying three bucks for arcade super breakout, and then Atari 2600 breakout, and then Atari 2600 super breakout? Nobody needs this much breakout, especially when it plays like this. The, the analog stick is certainly, that's, it's, this is terrible. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> this is a bad implementation of a classic. <laughs> ah! Oh. Not to mention, again, this was 2010. The freemium phone app model was well done and dusted at this point. Even premium retro games were a better deal. For example, less than a month after Game Room released, VH1 put out an Intellivision emulator app for iPad for $2.99 that gave you six games like Night Stalker, Skiing, Chip Shot Golf, Thin Ice, and Thundercastle for free with other games costing only 99 cents. All of these games, by the way, would appear on Game Room for more money. And of course, not to mention there was an Intellivision compilation released on PS2 several years earlier. At the time, they still had PS2 games at places like GameStop. You could have bought this compilation for a nickel, I'm sure. And every single Intellivision game that was on Game Room was also on that compilation. Even on Xbox Live, you can get classic games for arguably a better value. For example, Ye Are Kung Fu, Sorry for probably saying that wrong, I don't think I've ever actually said that out loud before now, but anyway, that game dropped on Game Room in July 2010, but had been available on Xbox Live Arcade since 2007. 
Yeah, but for 400 Microsoft points, AKA $5, so a little more expensive than Game Room, sure. But that version had online multiplayer. You can't make this stuff up. Oh, but if Game Room prices were too steep, you could at least harken back to the age of the arcade and do a single play for the equivalent of 50 cents a pop. You know, the amount you famously paid in arcades! Though you did get one free play as a demo if you wanted to try a game? Oh, and that's not even the end of it. You know all those cool flying mascots? Those were also up to 50 cents each. Like, no, 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 no. This obviously needed to be some sort of subscription service, some extra thing tacked on to Xbox Live Gold. But for whatever reason, Microsoft was not willing to make the jump. Now, maybe it was because they knew they didn't have the games to back it up, or that business model hadn't been proven quite yet. Obviously, the pay model was completely toxic and put a bullet in game room before they even had a chance to get it out the door. Who the hell was driving this bus? No one, it would appear. Remember Frank Pape? Well, he left in July. So, yeah. By mid-October 2010, Chrome Studios basically folded, putting new games for Game Room in serious question. The next month, Capcom released Capcom Arcade for iOS, which basically had the exact same business model and prices as Game Room, but with way better games. That basically killed the idea any other publishers might be interested in supporting this Xbox app. As for Microsoft, well, they were in the middle of Connectomania and a full-blown casual gamer era for Xbox. Bye-bye, Wii. <laughs> and no one casually buys hard hat for the Intellivision for $5. Actually, the most hardcore gamer thing I could find for Game Room was forums of people trying to figure out how to maximize their gamer score earnings by spending the least amount of money possible. The final game pack for Game Room was released December 22nd, 2010, and the worst part is the next release was supposed to include Sunset Riders! We didn't even, we had to wait 10 full years for re-release of Sunset Riders. You could have done a game room. You're, you, you really could have been something. Ugh. Though no new games came out, game room itself would not ride out into the sunset until being removed from storefronts in March 2015, with its servers not shutting down until October 31st, 2017. The final game count, 188 games, not even close to a thousand, not even close. And that was Game Room. A mostly good idea, executed badly, and then pretty much immediately abandoned. Why care about Game Room at all? Well, it is an interesting relic of its time, a response to Virtual Console that Nintendo really wouldn't top until maybe Switch Online, though there are still a lot of problems with Switch Online. I also see it as a precursor to Game Pass and Xbox's own eventual handling of backwards compatibility. However, the reason that I care about Game Room is because of Giant Bomb. You might have noticed that most of the footage is from Giant Bomb, and that is because not only is Game Room delisted, no one else was really covering it week to week, or at least Jeff Gersman, torturing his co-workers for months on end, is the last surviving footage of Game Room as it was happening. Grace, how many hours of Giant Bomb did you have to watch for this video? At, at least ten and a half. That's a good start. I, I mean, I, I took up embroidery. Yeah, that's, that almost makes you an honorary duder. Uh, yeah! It, and also, it was nostalgic for me. Uh, the Game Room videos are some of my favorite Giant Bomb videos. I was a little nostalgic for the kind of like classic golden era, original era of Giant Bomb, so I also went on to make this video as an excuse to watch old Giant Bomb videos again. We love you guys. Rest in peace to Ryan Davis. We are going to link to the Giant Bomb playlist below. If you don't want to watch that 10 hour epic, I recommend you do, but if you don't have the time for that, there is a great compilation, a great kind of overview of that entire epic saga. A compilation that I've watched at least once a year for a decade. We've been told to evacuate the building, but nothing stops the game room quick look. Nothing stops the game room quick look. What if we pass out from methane exposure? Yeah, what on if this we couch? pass out? And if I die playing Jackal, it's a life worth living. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to a new part of the uh, the credits here. We're trying something new here on the field, on on location, on location here uh, at the shelf. You know what? We're gonna start putting new stuff in the shelf here, and uh, we're gonna talk about it. For this video, we have the Xbox graveyard. I want I defy you to find somebody who's gotten more use out of a broken Xbox 360. Grace, please get a close up shot of that. This is the same Xbox 360 that we use in the Xbox 360 Red Ring of Death video. 
Uh, and fun fact, we shot that video over several hours. And then we wanted to get close-up shots of the Xbox 360 Red Ring. Uh, it started to work. The machine fixed itself in the middle of making that video. How did it break again? Do you remember? I don't know. It just I tried it again and it was broken again. But this is this is my original Xbox. Uh, and uh, even though it's dead, I picked it around. And there you go. Here we got connects on connects on Xboxes on Xboxes. Uh, fun fact, you cannot use this Xbox One Connect with this Xbox One. Um, you need to get an adapter. Anytime I've gone to a retro shop here in the Seattle area, and I was like, hey, do you have any uh, Xbox One Connect adapters? They always go, what? No, I don't think, no one's ever heard of this thing. And uh, I think I'm gonna have to spend like, maybe a little too much money to get one. But here I have it, I have my Xbox One uh, connect that I've never used and can't use, but I still have it with my 360 connect that I have used with uh, Star Wars connect, connect adventures, connect sports, and my Duke controller. Listen, do you have a problem with your set and you got to fill a lot of space visually? Slap a Duke controller in there and it'll fill a lot of space. It's a great controller in case it's, I like how the Xbox brand, the Xbox logo is the biggest damn thing on it. Get over yourself, yeah, Xbox. Let them know. Also the Xbox uh, 360. HD DVD drive. I kept the $5 mark on there. Thanks to our friends from Pink Gorilla. I like leaving price tags on stuff when they're ridiculous prices. Shouts to the local Seattle joint, Pink Gorilla. This was just, oh, these DS Game Boy boxes look like stairs. And here, here's a, here's a DVD remote for 360. Oh, here's the, the webcam for the 360. Uh, that, that I've wanted wait. to make a video on for like two years. What the fuck is it called? The Xbox Live Vision. That's what it was called. Yeah. Thank you for watching. I am Derek. I got producer Grace uh, behind the camera. We got more videos coming. We'll see you again real soon. Stay powerful. Thanks again for watching. Hey, dog. And good, good boys. Good buddies.